what I think are the main uh, messages and takeaways from the, the study and the report, which uh, for which I, I really want to thank uh, Gézac. Um, they have been uh, a fabulous partner in crime uh, to actually open their books, uh, be about uh, as truthful as possible and as uh, daring as possible in uh, the reality of the cultural and creative industries in uh, Europe before the crisis, during the crisis and after the crisis. Uh, and also um, to GESAC's partners, multiple partners across Europe and across the 10 sectors that make the cultural and creative industries. I'll tell you all about that in a second. So what I thought I'd do um, this afternoon to, to really open our discussion is to uh, take you uh, in three steps uh, through the before, the during and the after. Uh, you can see here some of the main messages and I will elaborate on, on most of them uh, in, uh, in my presentation. The, the sheer weight of the economy of culture, uh, a heavy weight uh, before the crisis. Um, you will see, and I think you will understand as a lot of you experience, unfortunately experience right now, the uh, enduring impact of the crisis on pretty much the whole culture uh, and the whole economy of culture and jobs and innovation and investment. Uh, but there is hope. There is hope if uh, the sector uh, works together, uh, counts on creativity, entrepreneurship, but also on some of the support that is being brought by the European uh, Commission, by the member states, and I'll tell you about that in a, uh, a third section. But first, uh, I want to start with a few words of introduction about the, the report. Uh, it is uh, pretty straightforward based on the uh, 2014, 2014 report that uh, Gézac had asked us to uh, do the first real report on the economy of culture in Europe, uh, to which we added a, a global uh, report uh, back in 2017, I believe, and several country reports on, you can see here, the French report that was published last year and we, which we updated throughout the crisis. Uh, with the help of France Creative, the uh, national representation of, of GESAC and representation of the 10 sectors that you can see here that really represent a, uh, the widest span. Uh, there are multiple definitions of uh, creativity and creative industries, but I think this one coming from UNESCO is the, the one that is the most stable and actually represent uh, the wealth, the, the diversity of creation. We can you know, always add Activities are very creative in industry, in food, in uh, in uh, fashion design, for instance. But this is really uh, culture at its heart, and 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 I think we can, if we have a stable uh, picture, look at all the years that you can see on the right hand side. Um, we went back to our previous study. We looked at 2019 as the last uh, benchmark year, and of course we estimated as much as possible the impact of the crisis uh, on, uh, for 2020. And as I said before, uh, we didn't stop there uh, to the risk of being depressed. Uh, and we uh, really worked with uh, multiple interviews, workshops with GESAC and, and many partners uh, to kind of uh, uh, draft and design and, and propose today uh, a platform for the growth, uh, the return to better health uh, of the sector, but also its growth and transformation in the years to come. Um, first, I, I think it's very important to stress uh, what culture had become uh, in the past two decades in Europe, a real heavyweight, a real economic heavyweight. This is a very important message because uh, maybe contrary to some other sectors that have been organized, more structured and have a long history of collective um, discussions and discussions with authorities. Um, uh, the economy of culture or the world of culture and creativity had not made its case, probably its economic business case, uh, well known uh, and, and again, as, as visibly as other sectors. But in truth, uh, what is uh, obvious now is that with uh, 643 billion euros at the end of 2019, uh, the sector represented 4.4% of the European GDP in terms of value added 253 billion euros. I'll try to be very modest with the numbers, uh, almost 2% of European GDP. Uh, what few people know is that the economic contribution of the cultural and creative industries is bigger 
uh, then telecommunications, high tech, pharmaceutical, the automotive industry. This is a message that I think has to be stressed um, as much as has to be stressed that it's a growing economy. It was a growing economy, I should say, before COVID hit the continent. 2.6% uh, on average in the past six years. So uh, an economy that has grown faster than the average uh, European economy. It actually translates into the creative workforce, uh, dynamic and diversified. Dynamic because with 7.6 million people employed, staffed, and uh, mostly active in one of the 10 sectors, um, it's an economy that had managed to create 700,000 new jobs over the past six years, 700,000. And you can see some of these sectors uh, here detailed. Uh, you know, it's, it's creative businesses and organizations, producers, uh, developers, distributors, creative agencies, editors, broadcasters, museums. So the whole variety of entities, systems, platforms, business model, we should say in the EY language. Um, what I found very interesting is that 90% uh, of this world, it, it, it actually tells a little bit about its vulnerability, but it's also very interesting in terms of private uh, initiatives, entrepreneurship, the sense of uh, empowerment and the, uh, the, the fact that you have uh, will and entrepreneurs uh, at, the, uh, at the, the root and at the heart of the sector. 90% of the sector is made of small, medium-sized businesses, but even more so micro enterprises or uh, individuals making the sector and making their life and their living out of the sector. Uh, in terms of diversity, the challenge of diversity in the sector is of course uh, still uh, in progress, as you can see in the film industry and in other industries. But when you look at the, uh, the workforce, uh, basically you have a sector that is almost half made and, and, and staffed by um, women. Uh, and it's actually more uh, than the rest of the uh, workforce uh, in the European economy across all industries and all sectors. So I wanted to stress that although there is progress to be made, uh, there is also uh, some bright sides to this diversity in the sector. Um, in the time before uh, the crisis, I think also it's important to stress some of the strengths and positive changes which we, see, which we see as opportunities for the sector and some of the challenges that actually uh, kind of aggravate uh, the state of the sector and the creative economy uh, as we speak. Um, the first challenge, positive challenge or opportunity that I want to stress is the fact that for Europe, uh, the uh, cultural and creative economy contributes very positively to the soft power of Europe. Very uh, often uh, criticized for its dispersion, uh, but um, in terms of sheer numbers, you can see here 8.6 billion euros in trade balance, positive trade balance in cultural goods in 2019. It's actually pretty equivalent or fairly equivalent to the trade balance of the food, drink, and tobacco industry, which is more recognized for its export capacity and activity uh, outside of Europe. Um, of course, the main markets in the book, audiovisual, uh, even in the tourism-related uh, industries, events, music, etc., performing arts, and I can't uh, name all of them at the same time, the sheer, the biggest market are still in Western and Southern Europe, but the growth, uh, the growth, the double digit growth actually comes from Central and Eastern European uh, countries, which have uh, made culture even part of their social fabric and, 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 and it actually takes the, the, the whole leveling up of the population of the European sentiment uh, up to, uh, to a certain level. Uh, heavy investment in innovation and digitization. There is a lot of talk and we're gonna talk about that because it's one, also one of the vulnerabilities of the sector uh, in uh, a, a lot of digitization and innovation in the way the experience is produced, but also, and I wanna stress that in the technical, in the commercial, in the production of, uh, of uh, cultural events, cultural arts, cultural works. And, and in, in, in a world of innovation, creation is innovation at heart. Um, there are, should be more, probably more support schemes to help entrepreneurs or individuals and companies and public organizations of the sector. 
Um, one of the misconceptions about the sector is that it is heavily subsidized. I think you can make a poll, maybe across and, and, and in this session, uh, and you'll hear anything from 60%, 80%, 40%. I've heard everything. Uh, the reality of the public financing of the cultural and creative industries in terms of the share of revenues coming from the public sector, national, regional, and local, is only 10.8%. And it's actually decreasing. You see it was 11.5% in 2013. So it's, 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 I think it's good in economic terms if you're looking at it from a business perspective and it, it's done good to other sectors, telecoms, automotive, et cetera. Uh, but it also is, uh, is, um, is a reason for fragility uh, that not everybody knows or expects from, from the sector. Um, in the lower half, what I want to stress is, of course, there's been a massive explosion, not because just because of 2020 and, and staying at home uh, imposed uh, internet as a, a channel, as a medium, as, a, as an experience that, that is actually most for most of us against our will, but 81% of EU internet users now use the internet for music, videos, and games. That's a reality. Um, and, and a lot of artists and creators are adapting to that. And the growth of online cultural content is double digit, 11.5 in the past uh, per year for the past five years. This is a fact. Uh, but what it creates is it creates an imbalance of power with uh, uh, the fact that uh, you have a global intermediaries and platforms uh, on the internet and, and the imbalance of power between a world of micro enterprises, which I stressed for a reason a few minutes ago, and this the massive uh, weight, power, imagination and, and entrepreneurship of net giants, intermediaries and platforms creates an imbalance that has many, many, creates many problems, many debates. Some are being solved as we speak again by the uh, European Commission or member states, but the remuneration of uh, rights holders, uh, the uh, proper functioning of the markets, the fight against illicit uh, content uh, is and the protection of intellectual property. But in economic terms, this is very, very much at the heart of the debate. But also in economic terms, uh, it creates imbalance that some sectors have have tried to uh, to solve by by encouraging uh, many concentrations and and also helping uh, European uh, giants in their in their selves to uh, to grow and to actually uh, protect some of the uh, assets that uh, that are located and are taxed in Europe and I think we need to talk about that in our debate. I want to stress that because uh, I thought actually what happened in 2020. Um, you've heard about it. I'm sure most of you have read the report, which is uh, available on rebuilding slash dash rebuilding dash Europe dot EU. Um, the uh, impact of the crisis is massive, minus 31 percent uh, in terms of revenue. So the sector as a total lost almost 200 billion euros of value in a year. And and if I can speak a little bit about 2021 without being able to give you a number, we know that we are going from a black year of closures, restrictions, lockdowns, curfews, um, to a year that will be probably for the first half, most of the first half, as dark and as a total probably uh, very impactful. Impactful more than most other industries, to the exception of air transport, which is slightly more impacted uh, per our estimates than the cultural and creative industries. But the massive impact uh, of, uh, of the crisis is, uh, is obvious now, and, and it, it actually translates into uh, 2 million jobs, almost 2 million jobs at risk, maybe loss also of vocations for younger artists and creators, and also for established or, or mature artists, creators, and, and companies that may have to diversify, go elsewhere and make a living. Uh, and, and that probably be a loss for, for the long term that, that uh, we have to uh, take care of. Uh, some of the consequences of the crisis are here on this uh, screen. I want to take you through this quickly to uh, save some time for the debate and just be you know, mindful of your time. Um, some of the uh, consequences, I've, 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 I think I've insisted enough, the drop in royalties, 
the uh, uh, increase in production costs. Uh, this will create further vulnerabilities for a sector made of individuals, micro enterprises, small and medium sized ent entities, and public organizations or publicly financed organizations that do not solely depend on public finance. And, and again, 11% in total means that the sector has to uh, probably uh, count on itself uh, for most of the future. And, 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 and that is something that we need to stress. Uh, banks are becoming also more careful across all industries, not only for, for this uh, sector, but we have to be mindful of that. Um, the tighter public expenditure that will be created by uh, uh, fewer tax revenues for most member states uh, is soft, also an issue that we heard during our interviews and our workshops. Um, one of the points that I really wanted to make is the on the left hand side, uh, the fact that uh, consumer spend on digital models do not compensate uh, for the loss of revenues generated in physical sales. Um, if you take the example of music sales, for instance, physical sales, CDs, vinyls uh, will be done 35%, have been done 35% on average in Europe in uh, 2020. Uh, whereas the uh, revenues, the digital revenues from the recorded music industries have only grown by approximately 8% according to the sources that we looked at. Um, and, and, and for some artists, performers, uh, or organizations that experience the uh, live concert, I mean, internet live concerts, they know how difficult it is to monetize uh, this experience, um, uh, although uh, it's, it's life as we uh, know it, and it has to continue. But finding its business model and not forgetting that the loss of physical, the loss of live and retail experiences are not at all compensated by the digital explosion and the digital growth that uh, we all experience. Um, we think that the outlook will be fairly gloomy for the past, for the next year or so, next year, maybe two years, uh, because of the, the need to regenerate uh, income, revenues, and to actually compensate uh, and, and pay back some of the loans in some countries. Actually, I wanted to take you uh, throughout Europe before concentrating and, and ending this presentation on uh, what we think are the three main challenges and priorities that we should put forward for this debate. Uh, here you have uh, not localized because we didn't want to point to a particular country that has supported the culture and creative industries more than another. Of course, there have been massive support in some countries and I think you know uh, probably where um, the culture has been taken into account uh, despite the sanitary restrictions, et cetera. Um, and it's happened everywhere from tens of millions to a few billions. So actually there is a wide span of public support on top of the regular um, support systems that are available for all the economies. But here on the right-hand side, you have some of the examples of the uh, recovery packages and the stimulus uh, packages that have been put together by member states. I think it's important to understand that if we are expecting a European support and, and help and assistance to the recovery and the transformation of the sector, it has to start or uh, leave and happen at the same time as it happens at the member state level. So it was important for us to kind of paint a picture of how much investment is being supported in cultural infrastructure, how much uh, the green uh, transformation of our economies is happening also and trying to uh, take place in, uh, in the cultural sectors, for instance, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of mobility to, uh, to uh, help and circular economy to help some of the events be uh, carbon positive or carbon neutral uh, at minimum. The transformation also of cultural organizations, public and private, but we insist here that uh, a lot of efforts have been made in some member states to transform uh, the administration of culture and the support of culture at local and national level. Um, there have been initiatives also to reform some of the social security systems, uh, very uh, present, even generous in some countries and absolutely absent in uh, uh, a lot of the EU countries. The support to performing arts have been uh, front and center in some countries because um, it was it is the first sector to suffer uh, almost minus 90% in terms of loss of revenues. Uh, Habib, I'll close by 
giving you uh, and 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 ending this presentation on uh, the three priorities that. Uh, the whole industry, the whole sectors, our partners, GESAC, has helped us put together. Uh, there is an issue with uh, financing the return to growth. There is an issue with uh, building a, uh, an inclusive and, uh, and more protective, I, I'll say the word, legislative framework uh, to kind of compensate for the unbalance and the uh, the problems created by uh, illicit content and the protection of intellectual property and copyrights. And also we feel, uh, and the, our interviews show that everybody's very confident that culture can play a bigger role and a role in the green transformation of Europe, in the fact that it's also a, 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 an element of the social fabric of Europe and can be part of the broader conversation of how um, tourism can transform, how retail and hospitality can transform, etc. There are very uh, direct proposals in the report, which I don't want to go into details from the 2% uh, of the RRF that we propose to earmark, that's in pillar number one, to the uh, actual uh, execution of the copyrights directive, which is very much at the heart of pillar number two. Uh, and, and European collaboration between producers, protection of European content, there are a lot of uh, probably 40 uh, to 50 uh, proposals and initiatives that I'm happy to discuss later or that you can find again at rebuilding-europe.eu and uh, I'll let uh, the panel discuss uh, uh, this and I want to thank you very much for listening.